right, everyone, let's get settled so I can get started. All righty. So before I launch into today's material, we're going to, as usual, have a quick look at what we covered yesterday. Oops. How are my slides doing? Yes. OK. So yesterday, we had a quick look. We didn't really go that deep into these, so we haven't started using them yet. But we've at least had a quick look at um, functions with libraries. So we looked at the idea that we can include other things from the C standard library, as we're, as we're calling it. And from those, they can provide us with different functions that we can use to do very particular things. So one of those that we already know and we've actually used a fair bit without, um, without discussing exactly what it was, was the include standard input output library. So the stdio.h that we've been using, the, um, I think the whole way through the course, actually, from the very first piece of code I showed you, where I said, don't worry about this, we'll talk about it later. Now we've talked about it. And now, <clears throat> excuse me, now we have the understanding that using hash include is like grabbing another file worth of code and basically pasting it into your code before the rest of your code happens. And that means that uh, your program is going to know about um, certain functions that's given to it by other bits of code. We're going to be using a few of them today, so we're going to be using a new library today that we haven't used before. We also talked about multidimensional arrays. So that's like having arrays inside arrays, which allows us to build things like two-dimensional uh, maps and things like that, or minesweeper minefields, if you will. <laughs> so today, we're going to look at memory in more detail. Um, we're going to have our first sort of look at what happens when a function runs, what actually happens in memory when a function runs. And we're going to start looking at, instead of always using variables to find a piece of memory, so up until now, we've used a variable name to find a piece of memory. Um, now we're getting to the point where we can directly address memory. And this is the things, these are things called pointers. Uh, pointers can get a little bit fiddly on the brain because they're like, you know, we think about variables and variables having a value. Pointers have a value that means they aim at a variable. So it's this way of accessing memory in a particular way. So we're going to go through the basics of that today. I'm going to show an example where we use some of them to, to get a little bit of work done. But then as we go on, we're going to learn more and more about these pointers and what they do. I think this would be the point where, if you've had a lot of experience in other programming languages, this is the point where C diverges a fair bit from other programming languages. Because most programming languages don't do uh, this kind of thing, which is direct access of memory and direct manipulation of memory like this. OK, uh, I've kind of spoken a little bit about this already, but I should, I should go through anyway. So when we use a library, we're going to add them into our code by using the hash include. Um, macro? I think it's a compiler flag. I always forget the proper technical terms for everything. Um, so once you've included one of these files, and these are usually going to be .h files, uh, you're able to use the functions that they have. If you want to, you can actually look these up, and you can actually look at the files themselves and read the code in them. Uh, it's not the easiest to read code. It's generally sort of reasonably machine readable, but not that amazingly human readable. What we usually do with these is instead of necessarily delving into the code of these files, we look up resources for them. So we look up um, things like our weekly test reference sheet has got some information on the functions. Um, and there's also websites online that have information about these functions that say, OK, for example, printf takes a certain kind of input, has the capability of taking more inputs if you want to print out variables has information there about the patterns, like the percent %d, the percent %lf that we've been using. And there's way more than that. There's about 10 to 15 of those different things to be able to print things out in different formats. We'll be looking at that a little bit in assignment two, I think. We will try to use a few more different format patterns to show how they work. Um, 
We are going to be poking into the C standard library again today with um, the actual one called standard library, STD uh, LIB. And we'll be using that one to do some of our memory functions, I think, if I remember correctly. I'm trying to remember if the demo I had today actually has that or not. I think it does, though. OK, so recap of multidimensional arrays. An array is multiples of identical variable types. They're not identical variables. They can have different values, but identical variable types. So each row of this array here, uh, sorry, each row of this multidimensional array is a single dimensional array that just has integers in it. And so if we want to, we can have multiple columns of this, and each column, sorry, I'm getting it the wrong way around, each row in this multidimensional array is an array itself, and the whole thing is an array of arrays. Um, I think I mentioned as well that you can build this up even further. You can go to a three-dimensional, you can go to a four-dimensional, but just be careful of like, I'm mean, usually once I hit four dimensions, I have to have a really, really good reason for it, or else I think I'm gonna confuse myself and forget how things are fitting together. Um, two dimensions is usually enough to do a lot of the things that we wanna do. Uh, One-dimensional arrays are also pretty handy in general, um, but we're going to be looking at two-dimensional arrays in the first assignment because you can do some interesting stuff with them and you'll get to see how much you can do in the assignment itself. All right. Slight extension on the format for arrays. When we were doing a single array, we only had a single dimensional array. We only had one set of square brackets. So the one set of square brackets just said, this is how long this array is. Once we're using a two-dimensional array or any kind of multi-dimensional array, we need more sets of coordinates to be able to say, okay, it's not just how long this array is now, it's how deep and how wide this array might be. And so this one's a four by four, which matches the size. Oh, wait, no, it doesn't. <laughs> this is a three by four here. And then in the same way that we had with arrays previously, the square brackets means two things. When you're making the array, the square brackets tells you how big the array is that you want to make. And then when you're using the array, the square brackets gives you access to an individual element inside the array. So if we're following the standing convention we're doing, that we're saying rows first, then columns, the first index takes you down to a particular row. The second index takes you across to a particular column so that you can find one particular element inside that array. There's a difference between whether we put square brackets on or don't put square brackets on when we're talking about an array. If we don't put the square brackets on, then we're talking about the whole array. So if we're trying to pass the whole array into a function, then we're probably not gonna put any square brackets on it. Uh, when we're looking for an individual element in the array, then we need to put all the sets of square brackets on. So in a 2D array, we need two sets of square brackets to give both coordinates to get a single element. And we can if we want to, this is thinking about the idea that the multi-dimensional array is an array of arrays, if I want a particular row of this only, I could put a single set of square brackets and pull out one of the rows and pass that in as, as if it was a one-dimensional array to another function. So lots of little fiddly bits in here that we can do. The trick is to remember that a one-dimensional array is an array that contains variables. So it contains integers or doubles for the moment. Um, we're going to go on and look at other types of variables pretty soon. And a two-dimensional array is an array that contains arrays. Now inside those arrays, you can access them. So it's nearly like this here that's accessing grid 2, 0 is accessing grid 2 first. And then we access grid 2, that gives us an array. And then we can put a square brackets after an array saying, I want a certain element of that array. So if you, if you split it up into its parts, you can sort of start to think about how it works like that. Okay, so now I want to go on to the idea of what it's like to think about the computer's memory. So my computer's memory is a, a massive big bank of on-off switches. Like, it's just these bits, and these bits can be zeros or ones. That's all they are. So you can do anything you want with it, and you get zeros and ones. When we start thinking about how we access these things, we think about we have, if I have, let's say, 16 gigabytes 
of, of memory of RAM in my computer at any point in time. That means it's a lot of stuff to search through to find what I want to find. So instead of, say, doing a while loop through all of my memory looking for a particular variable, what we remember is the locations of variables. So when it, anytime we declare a variable, it has an address in memory. And the, the way I like to think about this and the way that makes it kind of easy for people to think of is that think of every piece of memory as being a little house somewhere in a neighborhood. It's a, it's a really, really uniform neighborhood where all the houses are exactly the same size and they're all in like one, one, one entirely massive long row on one street. So it's a bit, it's a bit abstracted out, so it's not like, not like any of the suburbs that any of us may have grown up in or anything like that. But if we think of every house being a little piece of memory and every house having an address, we can use those addresses to then find those pieces of memory again. So we've already seen one example of this in action in our arrays. So if we just think of a one-dimensional array, let me just... Um, get drawing. So, okay. Yeah, good enough. So I've got a one-dimensional array like this. This one-dimensional array starts from the index 0, 1, 2, 3, Four, five. And each of the elements in that array are something. So if this is an integer array, so let's say it's an int array, then each of these squares here is 32 bits. Oops. Okay. 32 bit squares. If I want to access one of these and I don't want to have to look through them all to find it, then I just use its index to get there. So say I want to find this element here and put a 10 in here. This would be me saying, uh, I didn't actually name this, but I would access that via array four, for example. So if I want to do that kind of thing, that means I can jump directly to that particular variable and use it. We can think of our entire computer's memory as just one really big array. And instead of having particular size variables like integers and stuff like that, it has the smallest size we ever use, which is eight bits at a time, a single byte. And we can address each one of those bytes. Actually, I don't think we even use eight, eight bit at a time. I think that our current computers Every time you grab it, you're grabbing 64 bits of memory. But we can get smaller things when we want to because we have things like integers that are smaller than the 64, and we can still use those. Anyway, so we can see our computer's memory as if it's one gigantic array. And that gigantic array is managed by our operating system. Our operating system says, when you start running your program, I'll give you a part of this. You know, you can have a part of it. You, can't, you obviously can't have all of it. Because if you have all of it, that means that the operating itself is not running, operating system itself is not running, which means stuff like your mouse and keyboard won't run. Because everything that's running on our computer has some program somewhere that is running to make it work. Um, so the, the code that's making sure that my PowerPoint, oh, it's not actually PowerPoint, it's Google Slides, but anyway, my slides here are appearing on the screen is running somewhere in my memory. The program that's tracking my touchpad here to let my mouse move around is also sitting somewhere in my memory. And every time I run a C program, it sits somewhere in the memory as well. So everywhere in this gigantic array of, um, of information that is the memory of my computer, I can put things in there. And everything that goes into the memory has an address. And that address is unique. So there's a, there's a really specific number that says this variable inside this program is at this particular address, and it will be some weird, hard to read number, because they're usually in a type of numbering system called hexadecimal, which has uh, 16 digits in it instead of the normal 10 digits that we have. Don't worry too much about that. You can get deeper into that stuff later. Um, 
But if I have an address for that variable, then that is exactly what I'm going to find at that address. I'm not going to find that another part of another program or anything like that. I'm going to zero in in that giant array and find my variable in that position. So every address is an integer. So it's a number, it's a whole number, and it will line up with something somewhere in memory. So this diagram just says, somewhere in memory we've got all this stuff. And if I have some information somewhere in my computer, and I know the address of that information, I can always go back and find it. So in the same way that if I give you an address like, I don't know, 500 Anzac Parade, oh, actually, this is a bad example. Anzac Parade restarts its numbering in several different suburbs. But if, if I said 500 Anzac Parade Kingsford, for example, you would be able to find that location. So I could give that address to all of you and say, all right, Go now and meet there. I actually can guarantee not everyone will get there, but that's for different reasons. <laughs> but, but if we all did that right now and we all went there, we would all be able to find the same place. Memory addresses work the same way. If I have a memory address, which is the number that says exactly where a variable is, my program will always be able to find that variable again. So we can always go back to that same variable. So if I have something here in memory location 107, this probably exists by the way, because our memory starts counting from zero upwards. So it exists, Some, something in my computer is sitting in memory location 107. Um, I don't know what it is. I'm assuming it's something to do with Windows on a computer like this, because Windows takes up a whole lot of the beginning of the RAM usually. Or something that low, it might even be something like, I don't know, touchpad drivers or like something to make my hard disk run, something like that, who knows. But there's something there and as long as I have that address, I can always keep going back and finding it. So we're getting closer and closer to the, 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 the true technical side of this. If we consider every variable to be a house that sits somewhere in memory, and houses don't move around in memory, they have an address, and the house itself has a value written in it. So we can consider the idea that there are these houses in memory, and if we go and visit this house in memory and open the front door, walk inside, we can read the information that's in it. So we've been doing this a lot already. So every time we've used a variable, we've basically gone to the house where the variable is, because we've used the variable name to find it, open the door, look inside, and you go, okay, this integer is 280, or whatever, you know, whatever value it is, but you have to go to the house to be able to read it. So when we have an address now, the address is an integer, and our memory is this one long single street with numbers. And in the systems that we use, we use 64 bits to store those addresses. So it's pretty funny. Is anyone here, I don't know if you'd know or not, running a 32-bit computer? So we kind of, I think the era where we swapped over from 32-bit to 64-bit computers was about around the turn of the century, so around 2000. So that might be a bit too long ago for a lot of people. But the funny thing is when we only had 32 bits of memory, the way we were working with computers is 32 bits can address, I think, if we're addressing eight bytes at a time, was it, oh no, one byte at a time. I think we had a limit of about two gigs of memory. And so that's pretty funny now when we look at it and all our computers have a minimum of like four to eight gigs of memory in it. Back in the 32-bit era, which wasn't that long ago, was kind of most of your lifetimes, but still, it, was <laughs> it wasn't that long ago for me. Um, the 32-bit the system meant we had an upper limit on our memory. And when we start hit, hitting really large programs, that wanted more than two gigs of memory, we simply couldn't address it because we only had 32 bits worth of addresses. And that's why we end up with a 64-bit system. And I don't know how much two to the 64 bytes is, but I think two to the 64 bytes is some astronomically large number that we're not gonna reach any time in the foreseeable future. So that's the crossover. There's a little bit more computing history every now and then I'm gonna sneak that in, right? That we ended up in a 64-bit system because we actually ran out of addresses. So our street was longer than the number of numbers that we could put on it. Okay, so 
we have the value that we can put in memory, and that's the value is like what's inside the house. Then we have the address of the house itself, which is the number of where it is on the street. So we start to get to the point, oh, sorry, that was. <laughs> so I've already made this joke today because someone posted on the forums that there was an error in one of my slides. So someone was keen enough that they looked at my slides last night where I made them public at about 9 p.m. till today that, that there was an error in one of my slides. So whoever that was, thank you very much. It was anonymous, so I won't point you out or anything. Um, yeah, and I've already made the pun. I said that was a nice point about pointers. OK. <laughs> so pointers are a new variable type. And pointers, if I was to write down an address for you and say, get to this address somewhere in our world, and I give it to you, it's a piece of paper with an address written on it, that's kind of what a pointer is. So a pointer is a new variable that stores an integer, but it's not like the normal integers that we use. So the integers we've been using are 32-bit uh, variables that store a value that we can use. So we can use them to store numbers, we can count with them, we can add to them, subtract them, that kind of thing. Pointers do hold an integer type value, except they've got 64 bits to do that with, and what they hold is not a value that we're necessarily going to just be doing maths with and stuff like that. They specifically hold an address to a piece of memory. So the variable is the house. The pointer is the address of the house. But the pointer is also a variable. So the pointer exists somewhere in our computer. It's also stored in its own house somewhere in memory. But if you opened that house and look inside for the pointer, the pointer just gives you an address. So the way that we think about it is that when we create a pointer, when we create a variable that's a pointer, we're taking, um, we're taking a number and we're using that to aim at another house. So this is where pointers get a little bit confusing because the value that a pointer stores is not like a number that we particularly use. It's something that says there's another variable somewhere else. So it's like, hey, if you look at the pointer, the pointer says there's another piece of memory somewhere else. Here's the address of that other piece of memory. And you can go there now and look for other things. So it's a bit fiddly. But once we get a handle on it, you can see that pointers can be pretty useful. So I think the most fiddly thing about pointers is their, um, their syntax. So they use little symbols like a star and an and. and they're a little bit annoying because it just takes a while to remember exactly what they do. So when we're declaring a pointer, we use the star. So we've looked at this concept at least a little bit before, that when there's something like an array, we use the square brackets. And the square brackets became the symbol for the array. So it had two purposes. It had one purpose when it's created, and then another purpose when it's being used. So the square brackets said, this is how big my array is. And later on, it said, OK, now I want to look inside my array and find particular things. The pointer does a similar thing where we put a star on it to say, this thing is a pointer. So when we're creating pointers, there's a couple of pieces of information that we need to make this thing work. Pointers have a type which is kind of weird when you think about it, because if, things, if this thing is just storing an address and all memory is the same, all memory is just bytes of, of ones and zeros that we're carrying, the pointers have a type, because what they do is they actually say, this is where something is, and this is how much stuff you should look at when you get there. So if I have a pointer like this that says um, integer pointer IP, so I just called it IP there because it's like, happens to be an integer pointer that has no purpose at this point. The int here says this pointer is intended to aim at an integer. It may not always aim at an integer, but it's intended to aim at an integer, which means if you go to that house and open it up to look at it, you're opening up exactly 32 bits of memory, and then you're going to read it as if it was an integer. Because when we consider any 32 bits of memory anywhere in our computer, we can read them in different ways. 
So there are other variable types that are 32 bits in size. We could read them in different ways. But if I go to this pointer and I look in the house there, I'm expecting to see an integer there. So I'm going to read it as if it's an integer. The other half of this, the pointer is always going to store the address of a variable. So the pointer is always going to say, I know how to find something. And in order to know how to find something, you need to know initially where something is. And so then we get a symbol which I have been sort of trying to sneak in hints about what this was every time we've used scanf previously, is the and. So now you have the secret behind what was actually going on in that scanf. When we ran scanf and we put an and symbol, the ampersand symbol there, in front of a variable, what we were actually saying to scanf is we weren't saying to scanf, find this variable. We were saying to scanf, here is the address of this variable. Now you have access to the piece of memory that that variable is in, and you can write your information directly into that. So the and symbol takes any kind of variable and says, I'm not actually looking at the variable itself. What I'm looking at now, instead of the variable, is where it is. So the AND symbol, instead of saying this is the integer i, the AND symbol here says step outside the house that the variable i is in, have a look at the address on the, on the, the mailbox or whatever, or the, the front of the apartment block or whatever that's there. And that's what we're looking for here. So the AND says the address. So this little line here, I mean, it's not much code, but for the moment, it's kind of complicated because there's a lot of symbols going on here. I'm declaring a new pointer. It is a pointer because it has a star here, so I've used the symbol of the pointer to say I'm creating a pointer. A pointer is going to store an address. This particular pointer is storing the address of an integer. So I'm expecting that whatever this thing aims at is an integer variable. And so I've got my pointer thing there saying this is a pointer pointing at an integer. And like any variable, I can initialize it as I declare it. So I've got the equals there that's going to assign a value to this variable. And the value I'm expecting to go into that variable is an address, because it's a pointer. So I've taken this integer i. This integer i, as we've seen before, if I created the integer i, it's got 32 bits of memory somewhere in my computer. So for me to ask where that is in my computer, I put the and in front of the variable, and that says, can you step outside the house you're in and tell me what address you are? And the variable, it's not the variable itself doesn't do it. It's not like a little, little person sitting inside its house or anything. But my program is literally sort of, I shouldn't say literally, it's not literally going in and out of a house. But you can think of it that way. So it steps outside the house that I is in, looks at the address on the street there, and says, oh, okay, this is what it is. So let's say, this integer is at the address. Oh, hang on. Let me go back here. I guess this one's still an array, but I could get this here. And let's say in memory that was an integer called um, uh, int x if I'm going to get mathematical about that. And then if I say and x, so that's this one here, um, that would be 4 at this point. So let's say that's not an array, but it's a big chunk of memory, and I happen to be at memory location 4. I would have location 4, and I could put that number in a pointer. The pointer would then give me the address of that variable, and I can go back to it any time I want. I don't know if that helped or not. <laughs> my diagram's pretty messy there. All right, let me go back to my slides. OK, so that's the beginnings of what we're doing here. And the idea is that the pointer is an address. So the pointer allows us to find a variable. And then if we want to know exactly where that variable is, we can ask any variable what its address is by saying and on it. And you'll see how we've been doing this with scanf. So scanf actually wants an address. If you look really closely in the specification for scanf, it'll say that it's supposed to take a pointer as input, which means scanf wanted to know the address of something. And so for us to give it the address of something, we've been using and 
in front of a variable to give it a memory address, and then it's going to that memory and then writing into that memory. Okay, so pointers do have types, and we have, ooh, oops, I snuck in. <laughs> Ignore the third one. I haven't told you anything about that yet. We will, we will, it's happening next week. I just changed the order of things and forgot to change every single one of my slides. So we have ints and doubles, and for a pointer to point at a particular variable, it has to have the type that aims at that variable. So a little sneak peek that in the immediate future we will be looking at character variables that store letters as well as other things. But you can ignore that for now. That's just me leaving stuff in my slides by accident. Um, as I teach this course, I change the order of things. And so I used to do characters before pointers. So every variable has a type. Every pointer also has a type. And so the pointer types allow us to say that um, this address that we're storing, when we get to that address, we're going to look at a certain size of house, and we're also going to look at it in a certain way. So if I was to use an integer pointer and try to point it at a double, I would only end up reading the first 32 bits of the double, and I would convert them into an integer in some way, and it might actually end up looking very different from the number that was stored in the double. So that's why we want to be careful with this thing. Um, C is what's known as a typed language. So I can't remember whether we had this question in the tutorials or not. I think I saw it in the tutes earlier in the year. I don't know if your tutors necessarily went over it because it's not super necessary to know. But as a typed language, it means all of our variables are really, really specific about what they are. So all of our variables are super specific about exactly how many bits they use and also exactly how they're encoded. So you can't just read a double as if it was an integer or vice versa. There's some conversion going on when you do that, but um, we can't just say one can be seen as another. Um, they're really, really specific, and C will tell you that there's issues if you try to read an integer as... Actually, these are all really bad examples because these in some ways can be read as each other, but if I tried to read an array as if it was an integer, things would go weird. Okay. Another thing that we can do with pointers is we can use this thing called null. Um, null is a special keyword, um, and it's nearly like this has been hash defined in other files that we have. I, should, I say nearly, it's not nearly, it actually has. So the standard input output library that we're using in nearly everything has this hash defined in it, and the standard library and stuff like that has that in it as well. So it's a hash defined to say that if we want to specifically give a pointer no value. So if you were to give a pointer um, any random 64-bit worth of integer value, that's going to mean that it's aimed at memory somewhere. If we want to say that this pointer is not aimed at memory anywhere at all, we use this keyword null. So capitals, N-U-L-L, -L, that just says this thing's not pointed at memory. And what we can do then is we can have this keyword so we can check pointers before we use them. So we can say, I would like to access what this pointer is looking at. Can we just see whether this pointer actually has an address in it or not? We can check for null first. And if it's not null, it has an address. If it's null, it means we haven't given it an address yet. So it's kind of like a safety measure. Sometimes when we're working with integers, we've done stuff like make it negative one before we use it. But that doesn't stop you from using it. That still means you can do something with it. So the null is more specific than that. It says no value. It's not just like um, a specific memory area that we're not using in our program at the moment. This one specifically says not pointing at memory. So most of the time when we're initializing pointers, we're either going to make them and immediately point them at something that they're meant to be referencing, or we're going to point them at null and say, these are not in use right now. OK. So first off, we had a look at um, making a pointer. So this is this one here that I've made, which is the, the pointer IP that points at an integer. And the normal variable that we had that we've created already there is the integer i. So this is just a little code, kind of code snippet there. Then when we're using something, 
we have the option of using the star on a pointer or not. So the pointer variable here, IP, I could use it as it is, or I could use it with the star. So if I use it as it is, um, the value of the um, pointer is its address. So the value of the pointer just says, this is the piece of memory that I point at. If I want to actually go to that piece of memory and open the house and say, OK, this pointer was pointed at a variable. I want to know what value that variable had. I mean, that's the reason why we'd point at variables, right? Is so that we can get access to them again. We do that by reusing the star that we used originally to create the variable. So the technical term for this is called dereferencing. So the pointer is a reference to something. And to dereference is this, to go to it. And, and find out. The way I like to think about this with the addresses and houses and things is this little star is like Google Maps. So the little star says, follow these directions, get to the house itself, and open the door. So you go to the house itself, you open the door, and you read the value. So that's what the star is doing. So when I print this out, this one without the star is going to give me a memory address. And here's a new percent symbol here for printf that can give us memory addresses from pointers. And this one's just a raw integer, the way that we've been using it before. And we get that by saying, this is how we get there. Um, let me show you some of this stuff. OK, I'm just making a directory for lecture eight. Um, I do have the demo code here. I'm going to download the demo code instead of, um, instead of writing it from scratch. You can do this as well. You can see all the random stuff in here. I've got the um, last, last year's stuff archived in here as well. Um, where is it? <coughs> Week four. Oh, there it is. Pointers demo. Let's put that in the lecture eight directory. There. Okay. So going into lecture eight, I now have pointers.c in there. Um, I'm going to edit that. All right, so here's this file that I made partway through last year, looking at the pointers. And I'm just going to comment out most of this stuff here so that we can look at just one part of this code to begin with. OK. So this is the code from the slide that I had up a second ago there, which just says, let's make a pointer pointing at an integer variable. So I've got an integer variable, and I've created this pointer. So the star says I'm making a pointer. And the pointer's value that it's storing, the same way the integer stores a value, except pointers store an address, is the address of i. So and is like the symbol for address. So the address of i gets stored in this pointer here. So I've got some functions there. You don't have to worry about them for the moment. We'll show you those in a second. So this printf here, it's not exactly the same, but it does, it does have the same things. So that matches up with this. So I have the symbol for printing out an address and the pointer variable there. And then I have the symbol for pointing out an integer. And I have a star on the pointer variable there. And the star, as I was saying, is going to go to the variable that the pointer is aiming at. And it's going to say, I want to know the value of the variable at the pointer. So the way this works, I'm going to start a new one. Uh, I won't bother saving that. Okay. So 
Here's my memory. I do something like int i equals 10. This comes in here. And this is 32 bits. That's 32 bits of memory. And it has a particular location. So I'm going to give it a location here. I'll, I'll show you like the way this usually turns out is this is memory location 0x55. I'm making that up. Right? I have no idea where this thing is going to be. I trust my computer to just give me a piece of memory. So the way that these are usually laid out is they, they have a 0x in front of them to represent the fact that they're a hexadecimal number. But yeah, 0x55 is the number of the location. So that's the address of that variable. So if I was to say the and of i, this would be equal to 0x55. So that's not really code there. That's just saying that those are, the, those are equivalent. So if I then make a pointer, so over here, I'm going to make a new pointer called IP. That is going to create a variable for me in here. I'm going to give it a different color. Slightly bigger than the other one. So this is 64 bits. 64 bits of memory there. If I do the following, if I assign this pointer to point at the address of i, the address of i here, so that's actual code there. What happens is this, let me try to. So, no, oh, I should also put the 10 in there. So, this thing stores 10. So, what I'm getting here is the pointer stores in its memory, so its value is an address. And that address happens to be the location of this other variable, because I set it up here to say the address of i is what is stored in that pointer. And then I can use that pointer. So if I then do star ip, This will then take me to that memory address. So I can understand this is a little complicated. I should point out, I'm just going to keep saying point out every time I talk about pointers. Um, I, have, I have friends who, who are currently working as people like senior software engineers and software architects and stuff like that, pretty, pretty high level um, people in the computing world. I have friends who probably didn't get this concept for the first year after they were taught it. So I was one of them as well. I think this thing took me like six months before I actually got a handle on it and started using pointers in a way that actually made sense. So don't worry too much if this is like, what, right now? Because, <laughs> because what we've done now is we no longer just have variables and variables storing data. We have variables storing the access to other variables. So we've gone like full meta here. We've got one, we're stepping one level further away from the code into this abstract world. So if this doesn't make sense first go, don't worry. We're going to go over it again, and we're going to try to learn more about it. But hopefully this, I wonder if this um, diagram, I should have filmed this diagram. Actually, no, I have filmed this diagrams in the lecture recordings. So if you need to, go back and look over this again, because this is the kind of thing that happens when we use pointers. So the pointer itself has a value. The value is where another variable is. If we put the star on the pointer to use it, it gives us access back to the variable that it was aimed at. So this variable, oh, my pointer doesn't really work in paint. So the variable IP has a value. That value is the address of another variable, which gives this IP variable here the ability to go back to that variable and make changes to it and read it and things like that. OK, I'm going to hop back into the code here. So what we have happening here is exactly what I had done there. 
I've created an integer and I put a value into it. That integer is in my memory somewhere. Then I've created a pointer by putting a star in front of the variable name there. This variable is still just named IP. The star is just attached to it there. Um, and I've said that this pointer here is aimed at that other variable, which means it has access to that other variable, but it also stores the address of that other variable. So now if I do this printf statement, the first thing will say the address of the integer i, because that's what I stored in the pointer itself. And then the second thing follows that pointer to what it's aimed at. So it follows that address to the house that it's, that it's referencing and says, okay, what's inside that house? And so it reads the value of that. Let's compile this and run this and just see what we get. I'm just going to call it pointers. And I'll run that. Okay. So now the interesting thing is this first bit here which is a 64-bit integer in a hexadecimal encoding. So the hexadecimal digits are 0 through to 9, and then A, B, C, D, E, F. So that's how it has 16 single digits that it uses. And so if you have a 1, 0 in hexadecimal, it's actually 16, not 10. So I don't know how, how deep we've gone into maths of different number basing systems. This is the same as if you have a 1, 0 in binary. That means 2. Um, we get really used to working in a base 10 number system because we evolved counting with 10s. So, um, so we're really used to that one. But these other numbering systems exist, and we can use them for different purposes. The 16 base numbering system works really well on a binary computer because 16 is a, um, one of the multiples of 2. So anyway, what we're seeing here is this is the address. So this is um, where we may find this variable somewhere in memory. And then this is the value of the variable. And we've gotten the value of the variable not by using the variable itself, but by using the pointer that was aimed at the variable. So the pointer aims at the variable, and we followed the pointer through to where the variable is and read the 100 from it. And the way that we could find that variable is we used its address, which is this complicated number here. You won't generally have to deal with these that often. Like, we're not really going to look at the pointer values and things because they don't mean that much to us. You know, this is just looking into our memory somewhere and it exists. But what we will be doing is thinking about where we aimed this thing when we created it. So we don't need to know the actual address or anything like in the same way that you don't necessarily know the address of UNSW. I think UNSW actually has an Anzac Parade address. I don't know what the number is, but I know that it aims at UNSW. So that's the same way as if we just remember where our pointers are aimed at, then we know how to find things in them. OK, so that's the start of that. Um, so last week, oh, sorry, question there, yep. So the question was, when I have here int star ip, the question was, am I making a variable or a pointer? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Let me explain that better. <laughs> a pointer is actually a variable. So it's a variable in that here, when we made an integer, it got 32 bits of memory somewhere in my computer, and we can use it for stuff. When we make a pointer, it gets 64 bits of memory, and we can use it for stuff. The trick is the pointer itself has the address of another variable in it. So the pointer is a variable that stores the address of another variable. Yeah. So it's got, it's got that kind of double meaning. It gets really freaky when you think about the idea that the pointer also has an address. But let's not go there just yet. <laughs> yeah. So you are creating a variable. The type of that variable in this case is an integer pointer. So it's a pointer that aims at an integer. OK. So there's a bit of stuff I want to talk about with the way that we're going to use these with functions. So I want to talk a bit about how functions actually work. So I've been slowly building up 
what we know about functions. Although by the looks of everyone here, should I take a break now and then come back to this? <laughs> All right, people need time for this to soak in. Let me just um, skip to break time and I'll come back and talk more about pointers afterwards. So here's a break. Let me think about something with much, much less pressure. There's Minesweeper. Oh, I was going to say, there is actually a copy of the original Minesweeper on a Windows 3.1 computer on level one in K17. You can go and play it. I think my high school also there on that thing at the moment. Okay. Yeah, so why do we need a pointer? Ah, yeah, well, I haven't really spoken about that yet, but a pointer gives us the ability to see bits of memory that we couldn't access normally. So when you think about a function, you know when we make a function, it's in its own bit of memory, yeah. and it's a separate bit of memory. Yeah. It can't see the variables that are back in the main. Yeah. If we have pointers to them, then we can see the variables that are back in the main, and we can make changes to them. We can just make another variable. Yeah. yeah, except the limitations of our functions are that they only have one output at a time. So what if we wanted to change more than one variable? Oh, oh so you can just assign one pointer to several variables. Yeah, yeah, so you could have all of your variables in your, um, in your, in your main function, and yeah. then you can have pointers to each one of them. Pass all those pointers into a function, the function would have access to all of those variables. And it would be able to go back and make changes to them and things. Oh, I, see. I, I am about to talk about that. Oh. Wait, wait until after I've talked about it and see whether that makes more sense to you after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. cool. Like, I, try, I try to write a code on the terminal, and it says who turns this. So it's not actually this. this so there's that, that bit, but there's all this bit as well. Yeah. So there's just some more information here. Yeah, but it's not, so it's the not first bit should be that is the address of oh, i, it's the value of yeah, 100, yeah, oh. and then the other bits. So I commented those bits out just to not confuse people with all of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, Anna, what does ampersand refer to? And I. Ampersand says. Address. Address, okay. So you could nearly read ampersand as the word address every time you see it. Address. Because it's saying what is the address of that variable. Oh, okay. And then if you add asterisk, that's yeah. the asterisk says follow this to where it's storing information mm -hmm. and then ask what the information is. So if that's a pointer to an integer, yeah. the star says go to where that integer is and read that integer value. Uh, which is why it prints out the value. Yeah, yeah, which is why it prints out 100, even though IP itself does yeah. not store the value 100. 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That allows it to access the, the integer. Yeah. What's the idea? So which one is referencing and which one is dereferencing? Or is that just a So thing? a reference yeah. is like the and, which is like saying, okay, this is the address or yeah. something. And the dereference says follow the address to its location. So it's not an actual symbol? Not necessarily, oh, okay, no. Cool, yeah. gotcha. also, it's, it's nearly like yeah. we have different things where we call it pass by reference or pass by value. Reference gives you access to the memory that the, that the variable's in. Yeah. Value just gives you the same value that was in that memory. Great, repeat that slower this time. Okay, so reference gives yeah. you access to the original variable. Yes. Value just gives you a copy of what was stored in that variable. So value is just like saying the number five. Yeah, yeah. But reference says this integer that happens to be storing number five at the moment. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. And also, apparently GCC gives me that. So that it's a little different. Yeah, which if I convert it to hexadecimal, it gives me that there. So that implies my computer's 32 bits, right? Uh, not necessarily. It might just be chopping off some of the data. You can always, like, no, this is going to be a 64 bit because it's pretty yeah, new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Or it could be that the environment that you're running in is a simulated 32 bit environment because sometimes when you're running on yeah. Windows, it'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool, no worries. Hey. Um, so, as you say, if you put an N in front of I, it's like coming out of the house and look at the address. Yeah, yeah. So, if it's equal that address, why wouldn't it show the address? It when does when you do IP, but the star is a different function. Oh, so it's just the the star way. says, follow this to its address, open the house and look inside. Okay. Yeah. So if you're going to open the house and look inside, then you're going to get the value 100. Yeah. But the IP here without using the star is going to give you the address, okay. which is why the first number that comes out of this is the address, yeah. and the second number is the value. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool.
Okay, let's get started again. Hopefully everyone's brains are simmering and not overcooking at the moment. <laughs> Is that working? It is working. Oh yeah, it's working. All right, let's go. Okay, so I'm gonna go back through my slides. I think I, think I might not end up writing that much code today because I have a code example for later. Because I think that what we're going to need to do is talk a bit more about these pointers before we get too deep into it. So I may end up doing some video content for you on the code demos for this. All right, let's settle, everybody. Let's get going again. So I had a really good question in the break, and that question was, why do we actually need these? <laughs> it's like, they hurt my brain, what are they for? <laughs> so. I will show you some of the ideas about what happens when we call a function and then what we can do when we're calling a function that helps us to actually, um, there's, there's certain types of things we can do with functions that we can only do with pointers that we can't do with normal variables. So I'll show you one example of that in a second. Um, okay, but before we do that, I need to talk a little bit about how functions work. So as I've, been, as I've been teaching you stuff, I've been slowly building up the amount of information that I give you because if I told you everything about C in the first like week of us learning, then I'm pretty sure most of it would just go straight out of your head and you'd be like, I have no idea what's going on. Kind of like what just happened in the first hour then. But <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> it's okay. Okay, so let me tell you little secrets about the theory of teaching is that we will often tell you something that you don't understand so that the next time we tell it to you, it becomes clearer, and then the next time we tell it to you, you genuinely understand it. So we can't necessarily hope that everyone's just going to pick up point as the first go like that. It's not that kind of thing, but we're going to be using them for the next six weeks. So is it six weeks? Yeah, six weeks. Next six weeks, we're going to keep using them, and then as we keep using them, showing them in different ways, hopefully they'll start to sink in one way or another. But I want to talk about functions, because I've spoken a little bit about functions, but I'd never really told you about what's going on under the hood when a function runs. So when a function gets called, certain things happen. So we can, I'm going to talk about this in a bit, give um, functions pointers as input. But what I want to talk about first is what happens when we give information to a function. So all the functions that we had that we've been using were being given input. So if I had a function that added two numbers together, you know, something super simple like that, I was going to give it, to give it two integer variables. So in previous examples, I said, okay, first integer variable is four, second integer variable is six. Here's a function that adds those numbers together. Now, the interesting thing is that what the function receives is not the variable. A function is never given a variable. It is only given the value that can be read out of that variable. So it is not given access to the memory itself that the variable is sitting in. So if I create an integer, I get 32 bits of memory for that integer. That's somewhere in my computer, 32 bits of memory. When I call a function and I give the function that variable, the function never sees that 32 bits of memory. We would copy out whatever value is in those 32 bits of memory, give it to that function. The function would then create its own variable that has the same number in it as that other variable. So two completely separate variables, they just happen to have the same value when they're used. And we call that passing in by value. And the thing that's gonna get confusing about this as you go further in is that some programming languages pass by value and others do this thing called pass by reference where you do get access to the old variable and you can work with it. So most of the time we get passed in by value. So the Function itself in its own piece of memory gets a separate copy of a variable, whereas the, um, the, the variable itself just stays where it was. However, if I want to give a pointer to a function, that's like saying there's a variable somewhere and it has this address. 
if I give you this address, like say give one of you this address and say run this function, then you will still have access to that variable. I've got some diagrams here that show this a little bit better. So, this is two pieces of memory in my computer. So my main is sitting in memory and it has a variable. When my function runs, it takes input from my main, which is that variable, and note that now that variable kind of has two copies. So it has the copy that it had in the main, but my function has its own memory and it has its own copy of that variable, which means if my function makes any changes to the input values that came in, they're not going to make any changes to the variable in the main. They're only going to change the copy that's in there. The difference is when we start using pointers. So, in my main, I have created a pointer to a variable. So there's my variable there, and there's my pointer to my variable. The pointer doesn't store the information that the variable stores. So it doesn't store the value. It stores the location of that variable, and it can find that variable again via that location. If I call a function, and I give the function that pointer, I get a copy of that pointer. So these are two separate pointers. They're not the same pointer. They happen to be pointing at the same thing, but they're not the same, two separate pointers. But the interesting thing about pointers is they don't store the values themselves. They tell you how to find a value. So this function now, using this pointer, can access the memory that this variable's in. So if I use this pointer with a star, it says, follow this pointer to the address that it's aimed at, open the door, go inside, look at the value that's in there. Which means, this is like me giving that address, that random address I pulled out of my head before, 500 Anzac Parade. If I have something at 500 Anzac Parade, so I've stored some information at 500 Anzac Parade, and I've said, okay, here's the address that says 500 Anzac Parade, and then I can write down another copy of that. So I've got that on a piece of paper. I write down another copy on a piece of paper saying 500 Anzac Parade. Give that to one of you and say run this function. Then you have a copy of the pointer, but that still gives you access to the original variable. So now we have the capability to run functions that have access to our variables in our main. And we didn't have that before, because everything that we'd been doing before with functions was just passing the variable in here. So any changes we made to the variable were never changing the variable that's in our main. You can try this with everything except for arrays. Arrays are different. But with any other variables, you can try this and make changes to it, and nothing changes except for um, the variable that exists inside the function. So this is showing that functions actually sit in memory in a different place from the um, uh, from other functions. So every function is in its own little space. And then we think about this like with the curly brackets, right? So the curly brackets in, in code are sort of separating the code. The functions are very, very separate from other pieces of code. Not only are they working in their own space, they can't actually see anything that's in the main unless they're given access to it. And if they're given access to it via a pointer, then using that pointer, they can go back and see what other things are. So here are some examples, and I'll go into the code and show these in a second as well. So if I have a function that says, please increment this integer. Obviously, this is very trivial function, because usually we would just put plus plus after the integer, and we would go up by one. But if I had a function to do something like this, if I said increment an integer n, and I pass it an integer, this would create a new copy of that n, and it would add one to it, and then it would end. And then that new variable that I've just created there that I've added one to just disappears. So nothing happens to it. Whereas, if I increment via a pointer, if I get given a pointer to a variable, and I increment that variable, that's actually going to go back to that variable in memory and increment it. So let's go back and start another diagram. And I will show you how this works. Mm. Uh, okay. <laughs> I probably should have saved that anyway. <laughs> okay, so here I have the memory for my main. And I've created an integer here 
and it's got number five in it. Then I call a function called increment. Ooh. Yeah, well, I said the word so you know what that's supposed to mean. An increment takes in that integer. I'm going to get an integer name. Um, I'm going to call it num. So increment, when it gets called, gets given num Good. as its input. So in here, it will then have another variable with a value of 5. This is not the same as this variable here, the, um, the int num that's in my main. It's a copy of it because this is how functions work. Functions don't give you access to the variables from where they were called. They make new variables and they take in the values of things that they were given. So if I run increment now, it's going to add 1 to this. So 5. Oops. I'm going to brush again. 5 becomes 6. So this goes up by 1. And then the code for increment finishes. It finishes doing what it was doing. And it ends. And when it ends, its memory goes away. So the interesting thing about this is after I've run this function, nothing has happened to the number that's in my main. Because I passed the number into the function, and all I got was the value going over. So if I do this other one called increment, I'm just going to put a capital P there rather than spelling out increment pointer. So increment pointer is going to take a certain input. And so we've got a pointer here. Um, I'm just going to call it P because I'm running out of space. This pointer points at that um, number variable. So it's going to have an address value in it. So it's going to be 0x something, something, something. 0x blah. That's not valid, but you know, it's, it's some address value for that. When I call increment pointer and I put that P in there, I am going to be given a copy of that pointer. So it's going to be 0x blah. <laughs> I'm just going to assume the 0x blah is going to work for me. Then when I run this, I'm going to try to add 1 to whatever is at the location 0x blah. And the cool thing about that is this points back at that number. So this gives me access to that variable because it knew what the address of that variable was. So if I've created a pointer that knows where that variable is, it means I can always find that variable even if this function usually can't access that memory. So usually you can't cross over between these boxes. But if you know exactly where you're going, you can. It's like a treasure map. Go 100 paces east, dig six feet down, X marks the spot, right? So this pointer says I can get to that variable, which means when I run this increment, what it will then do is it will follow up to this variable and it will change it. So that thing can increment it. All right, let's have a look at the code. So I have two functions here that I've created. So their um, declarations are up here saying one of them increments with an integer, and the other one increments with an integer pointer. So this one says, and I've got a handy comment here saying the function will have no effect. Because it creates a new integer n when the function gets started, that integer n has a copy of the value. And so the value was i, which is 100. So integer n equals 100. n equals 101. That won't make any changes to i. And so we should get this one saying that hasn't changed. But this other one is increment pointer. And that gets given ip, which is the pointer to i, which is the address of i, which allows it to access 
that variable there, it knows of it as n because it has a pointer here that's aimed at it. And if we use the star on it, the star says, you're a pointer. You store an address. The star says, I am going to follow you to where you're aiming at, and then I'm going to look at whatever's in memory there. So n is a memory address, and n was a copy of the memory address that was the address of i there, which gives us access to the variable i. So I'm just going to comment out this next example here. So we can run this. Uh, we can compile this first and then run it. So the first line is the same thing we looked at before, which is saying, OK, this is the difference between us looking at the address or following the address to the variable itself. And then we see the two things. i100 hasn't changed. So that was us looking at a function. And the function was just saying, I get given the value of i, which is 100, and I add 1 to it. So the value in my function is 101. But the value here that I'm printing out is the variable i, which hasn't changed after the increment i function. However, if I increment using a pointer, the pointer in this way had access to the variable that was in my main and can make changes to it. So when it makes those changes, i then becomes 101. So that's one of the things that we can do with pointers that's pretty handy. The other thing that this does now is we're now no longer limited to having only one output for our functions. We can actually give our function pointers to multiple variables, and then our function can just change those multiple variables. And here's an example of something that we flat out cannot do without pointers in our functions. So if I was to give you two numbers and say, swap what is stored in those variables, then there's no way you can do this with the functions the way that we had them before. Because there's only one output for a function. A function can only transform into one value. So if I have two numbers, n and m, and I say, I want to change what's in these two, then there's no way that I can use my previous functions to take the value of one, put it in the other, and take the value of the other, and put it back in that other one. Because there's only one output. There's only one integer we can use. Question there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if we have pointers to n and m, I should draw this one as well. So if we have pointers to two different variables and we want to swap them around, we can do that with this code. I'm going to start a new one. OK. So this is a swap. So in my main here, I have two variables. So this is variable A and this is variable B. Oops. And I have the pointers. aimed at each of these. Then in my swap function here, I would get copies of these two pointers. So there's a copy of that pointer there. And then I'll use a different color. This pointer goes to there. So one of them is able to access B. So this one's able to access B. And this other one is able to access A. So these are able to look into those variables. So for me to do a swap, what I would do is I would create another variable here. And this is called temp, because it doesn't really need to, to exist beyond this function. And the way that we do a swap of variables is I could take one of these. I can't remember which one I did first in the code. So I made some temporary space. And the temporary was equal to whatever was in n. 
So let me put some values in these. So this one is 7 and this one is 4. So n was this first one. So this one is a copy of this address, which leads to that one, which is 4. So if I put a star on this first pointer here, it'll follow this to its location. And so temporary would be equal to 4. The next line says n is now equal to m. Oops, wrong one. Here. So the 4 there is now, instead of it being equal to what it was before, it's going to be equal to whatever is pointing at the other one. Interesting thing about this is, let's look at where the stars are. So I'm saying star n is equal to star m. So that means I am not working in this space here where I am. I'm actually, there's no, I don't have a good pointer when I'm in paint. I'm actually using stars, which means I'm following things back to the memory locations they aim at. So what I'm actually doing is I'm coming back over here and I'm saying you are no longer equal to this. You're equal to whatever the other one was. So you're now equal to 7. And then I take the other pointer, the other pointer m, and I say you're equal to temp. So the temp here doesn't have a star on it because it's a normal variable. So I'm just taking the value out of a normal variable and I'm writing that into a memory location that I use by following the other pointer. So I follow this pointer. So this was, I should just put the names in this. This was the pointer n and this was the pointer m. So I take this pointer and I say, where's the memory you're pointing at? And the memory they're pointing at is back over here. And this is the a. And I want you to write the number 4 into there. So I'm saying take star m, which so the star on the m means we're going to go all the way back here, and then write this value into it. So this goes away. Uh, use the other color. And the 4 gets written in there. So using pointers to get access back to memory means I can actually swap the value of two variables without losing any of that information. And then when I'm done here, the temp just goes away because I didn't need the temp. The temp was just temporary storage while I was swapping things around. So this is an interesting bit of code because it's reasonably simple and the concept is reasonably simple. I just want to take the value of two variables and swap them over. But instead of being able to just do that, so if I did this in my main, I could do this by taking all these stars out and just going, OK, just use these variables themselves and swap them. But if I want to do this in a function, this is actually impossible to do without pointers. Because the pointers can't access, uh, well, a normal function can't make changes to more than one value at a time, because it only has one output value. Whereas if we do this with pointers, we can say, there are two of these and I have access to both of them because I know both their memory addresses, which means I can make changes to more than one variable. OK. Now we get a slightly compl slight complication to this, is that um, arrays, now you may have noticed this already. I don't know how many people have tried to put an array into a function so far. I'm pretty sure we have had at least one of these in the labs, but it might be this week rather than last week. Because I think we didn't have any arrays in the labs until this week. So not everyone would have seen this yet. But some of you may have looked at this. The array variable. So this is not talking about anything that's inside the array. This is when I'm talking about the whole array itself. So if I give an array to something, and what I'm giving it is anything that's without the square brackets. So I'm, what I'm saying is I'm giving you the whole array. That's actually a pointer to the start of the array. So an array and a pointer are actually identical. The array has an intention that it has a certain number of elements in it. But the actual value that you pass to something when you give an array to a function is the memory address of the start of the array, which is also the memory address of the first element of the array. And this is where we get into the square brackets thing, where I was saying the square brackets is how far along into memory you go. Because the array is a big block of memory, and the indexes are how far into memory you go. So what they're actually doing is they're taking the first address 
of the array, and they're saying, go three integers worth in. So if you go three integers further in, you'll end up in the fourth element of the array. So the way that we're addressing arrays is like saying, take a pointer to memory, and then go 10 further. Oh, sorry, that's a declaration. But <laughs> here it was like, OK, take the address of the array and don't go any further into it. So the interesting thing about this is if I ask for the address of the first element, that will actually be the same as the value stored in the name of the array itself. If I take the address of further elements in, they will be just a little bit further in memory. So let me show you that in code here, and I might just comment out the other bits so we don't get confused by the other things that are running at the same time. Um, there we go. And there. So now my code just has an integer array. And then what it does is I can say, print out the address of the first element and print out the address of the array itself. And the interesting thing is I don't even need an AND on this because the array, the name of the array itself is a pointer. So the name of the array itself is telling us where the first element of the array is. So these two numbers should be the same. I'm going to add some more code in here for the hell of it. So if I want to say the second element is at a particular address, so we'll do a percent %p for the pointer. So pointers are addresses, same thing, so I'm just printing out the pointer. And I can say, give me the address of the second element. What we should see here is something that's just exactly a little bit higher than the previous one, because these elements are next to each other in memory, because arrays are a single large block of memory with everything in it. I might actually copy paste this so we can see the pattern if I look at the third element as well. So the third element is here. And what we should see here is the address of the array, the address of the start of the array, and they should be the same thing. So the first element in the array and the start of the array is the same position in memory. And then we're going to see the memory locations of some of the other elements. So let's compile that and run that and see how we go. I should have lined these up a bit more to make them easier. OK. First element here is at this arbitrarily large number. So this is somewhere in my computer's memory where my array is being stored. This was the first element, and this was the array itself. So this just shows you that the whole array is a big chunk of memory, and the first element of the array is the, exactly the same position as the start of the array. So this is why when we do array 0, what we're saying is don't go any further into memory to get the first element, because the first element's exactly at the start of the array. So they're the same. And then the second element is here. And if you note, if we look at these numbers carefully, this is exactly 4 further. So exactly 4 further than the, the first element of the array is the second element of the array. And as I said before, every house in our memory is worth 1 byte. One byte is eight bits. Four bytes is 32 bits. So my second element of the array is exactly four bytes further along than my first one. So that's like saying, in memory, my first integer in that array was 32 bits. So where I go looking for the second integer in that array is exactly 32 bits further along than my first one. And we'll see the next one is an eight instead of a four there. That's another 32 bits further along in memory. So we're starting to see how if I have an array in memory, and I said before that the array in memory was 32-bit chunks, and each of those 32-bit chunks was an integer, I now move along those addresses exactly 32 bits further along, and I can get to different elements of the array. So what we're doing is we're slowly expanding what we understand about how our computer memory works and how we're addressing it and stuff. So we're actually getting the, the genuine details of how these things work. So <laughs> this is the same thing. And you've, like, I, I ran out of memes for things that 
that, that, that go within themselves, actually, because I had the Inception one, and then I had the, the, um, the Pimp My Ride one. But, but I did find this one. Pointers are variables. So we, we've had that question uh, earlier where we were looking at, like, okay, we can declare a pointer as a variable, which means that the pointer exists in memory somewhere, which means the pointer has an address for where it exists, which means you can point pointers at pointers. And you can point pointers at pointers and point those pointers at pointers and stuff, and you have this big chain of things, and you can put five stars in front of something saying, follow this to this address, then follow the address you find in that house to another address, follow that address in that house to find another address, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> You can tell already that once you get even to a mild level of this, then the human brain just explodes. It just, it just doesn't deal with this. So in this course, we are not going to deal with pointers aiming at other pointers, but you will find uses for these in the future. So there will be reasons to point pointers at other pointers um, and then follow maybe halfway in to get to one depth of pointer or follow further in to, to follow a chain of addresses through to other things. But for now, we're going to keep it to the point where when we look at pointers, we're just going to look at the variable that it points at. We're not necessarily going to go deeper. But it can happen, and there are uses for it. OK, so that was the break. So that was like all of the, the theory that I was going to talk about today. And now we're going to look at some code. Um, I've gone a bit over time on the theory, but I think we needed that. I don't know what you think, but I think we needed that extra time. So I will start this program here, but what I might do, um, so I'm going to do a live stream on Friday, so I might do the rest of this code in the live stream for people to look at, but also I do want to dedicate a fair amount of time in that live stream to talking about the assignment and how it works. Don't worry if you can't make the live stream. I haven't actually announced what time it's going to be, but it'll be Friday afternoon-ish. Um, don't worry if you don't make it, because I'm going to record the whole thing. OK, so here's the program we're going to make. I'm calling this program the jumbler. So what this program's going to do is we're going to take numbers as inputs, and using those numbers, we're going to fill up an array with numbers. We're then going to aim pointers at that array. And aiming pointers at that array, we're going to use that swap function we did before to swap numbers. And so what we're aiming at is the idea that we can take an array of numbers and then swap bits of that array to jumble the numbers up. So it's like shuffling a deck of cards. Well, it's a little bit more specific than shuffling a deck of cards, but I'm taking pairs of numbers and swapping them so that that way my, my a array ends up a jumbled mess of numbers rather than the, the set of numbers I was given. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to be really careful to separate everything that we do into functions. So this is a little bit on the pointers and a little bit on functions. And so we're going to, in the way that previously we'd been breaking down our problem into parts, then solving it in parts, we're actually going to go one level deeper when we're breaking this into parts. And what we're going to do is say, each part that we're working on is going to go in its own separate function, and we're going to work on it there. So taking numbers as inputs, jumbling their order, then printing them back out. So we can split this up into different things that we want to do. So we can have a function that reads the inputs. Um, we can have a different function that swaps the numbers. I've actually shown you that function already. Um, and then we can have a function that uses that swap multiple times to really jumble up an array. And another function that prints out the numbers. So a function to print out all the numbers in the array, I think that you already know this. I think we've already seen this um, multiple times. And you've probably done this in your labs already. Oh, well, actually, not everyone's done it in the labs already. But at least we have the idea that we can do a while loop through an array and, and see everything. OK, let's read the input. I'm going to jump straight into code here. All right, I'm going to make a new file called jumbler. Here, um, I'm going to say code demo for pointers and functions. Jumbler reads input, stores it in an array. Um, messes up that input. 
by swapping repeatedly. Prints the output. Okay, so that's roughly what I want this thing to do. Remember how I was talking about writing comments before you write code? This is the kind of thing where I keep this in my code so I remember what it, what it is I'm going to try to do. And it was made by me. 11th of March, 2020. I still nearly typed in 2019 just then. Okay, I think I'm going to need my input and output, definitely, because I'm reading and printing stuff out. I've got my int main void. I can put my return zero in there. You may notice that some of my examples don't have the return zero because I forget to put it in there because C is actually pretty friendly and it does it automatically for you anyway. Okay, I want to separate things into functions. So the first thing I'm going to do is write a function that reads input using stuff like scanf and puts that into an array. So I'm going to declare a function here uh, I think it's a void function because I don't think I need any information back. Oh, actually, maybe I do. Maybe I do want some information back. Um, I'm going to call it read inputs. And it needs to know where to put these inputs. So I'm going to give it a pointer to a location where it's going to write these inputs. But the nice thing about what this pointer is is it's actually an array. So the pointer and the array are the same thing. So I'm just going to call it nums for numbers. I might want to have a hash defined for the size of this array. So someone, I remember they were over in that part of the lecture theater, was asking me last week about using arrays of different sizes and how do you know how big an array is going to be. Um, so what we're actually going to do here is we're going to have two numbers. One is the actual number of numbers that have been typed in and the other is the maximum possible set of numbers that we could use. So I'm going to define <laughs> my spelling there. <laughs> okay, okay, slow down and type. Sorry, the point has got to me as well. I'm just like, Ugh. okay. The maximum possible set of numbers that I'm going to take in from my input, I'm going to set that to 100. I don't expect anyone's going to sit there and type in 100 different integers. So I think that 100 is okay as a maximum, which means that The array size I'm expecting to get there is the maximum number. So I'm going to be passing around a reference to this 100 length array. And I'm going to make sure when I'm reading it, I'm not going to read more than 100 things. So read inputs is going to do that, which means I need to then also, I'm going to copy that line, but without the semicolon. Paste that down here. And this time with the curly brackets, it says this is what it's going to be. And I'm also going to put a comment here to say what this function does. Read inputs from standard input. Return how many inputs were given. Let me just go back to my slides and make sure this is exactly how I wanted to do this. We're going to ask them how many numbers that they put in first, and then we're going to scan in that many numbers. I was wondering why I did it that way, and then I remembered something about the assignment. Anyway, <laughs> so. <laughs> See, I'm not that bad. I will, I will teach you some things that help for the assignment. So first thing we're going to say is to um, I'm going to say read a specific number of inputs from standard input. User will specify how many. All right, that's not the best comment. I would probably rewrite that so it reads better. 
But, you know, so the user is going to tell me how many inputs. So the first thing I'm going to ask for is a number, and that's going to be how many inputs. And then I'm going to loop through that many times and read in that many things. Um, so the first thing is um, I have an input count. I'm going to say that's equal to zero to begin with because I'm going to move that up so it's a bit higher. You can see it over people's heads more easily that way. Then I'm going to ask my user how many. How many inputs? And I'm going to scan what they say to me. Oops. as a number, and I'm going to put that into input count. And now you're seeing me use the AND here. So what I'm giving scan S, X scan F is a pointer to the variable input count. By giving it the address of the variable input count, that's the same as saying here's a pointer to that address, which means that scan F can now go to that variable and make changes to it, which is what we've been doing with scan F all along. But now we know the mechanics behind it. OK, so scanf is going to read that in there. And then I'm going to loop through up until input count. So I'm going to start a new loop. And I might just make the structure of my loop first. Forgetting the space there. Um, so i is less than input count. I do have to be a bit careful here. Because if my user gives me an input count that's higher than 100, I'm still not going to accept more than that. Because my array only has space for 100. So I'm going to say i has to be less than input count, but i also has to be less than my maximum size. So this is me having two stopping cases for my while loop and saying if you go over either of these numbers, I have a problem. So the i has to stay below both of those numbers. And I've got my i++ there. So that structure of that while loop should work correctly. And then I think about what code I want to put in here. I'm going to put a comment in there saying, have processed i inputs. So these little comments are really handy for me because it's, um, they will remind me of exactly what I'm doing inside my while loop. So every time I go into my while loop, i has a value, and I know that that's how many times I've done something so far. So for each of those things in the input count, I am going to scan f a certain number of inputs. Um, and these are just integers. And where I'm putting these is in this array. So I assume that this array has been given to me so that I can access it. So remember, the array is a pointer, which gives me access to its memory. So I can write things there into the array. So I need the address of locations in the array where I want to, where I want to put these numbers. So the array is called nums. And then where I want to be in this array as I'm looping through and putting elements in is I want to be indexing into i. So this complicated little chunk of code here says, as the i goes up, I'm moving through the array or looking at different elements. So this bit here is grabbing each element of the array as we go through. It might not go all the way to the end of the array because I might have the how many inputs might only be five inputs. So I might only be using the first few. But for each of those, I am going to find the address of each one of those variables. And I'm going to say, OK, scanf is going to write into that one. And then it's going to write into this one. Then it's going to write into this one, and so on, until it's filled out however much of the array I wanted to fill out. So that scanf there is going to read numbers and put those numbers in the array nums here. And it's going to loop through until it finishes. Um, and then at the end of this, i is exactly how many numbers we read. So the interesting thing about that is i could be several possible values. 
So it could be the exact input count that the person, actually no, it's only two possible values. It could be the input count that the person had um, typed in, but if they typed in a number above 100, it's going to be exactly how many were read in. So we would stop at 100 if, um, if I here hit max nums. So if I is exactly how many numbers we read in, that's the value we're going to return. Because this thing was going to return exactly how many inputs, I'm not going to say we're given, we're read in. So at some point, if they had tried to give me more than I was supposed to have, then I wouldn't have taken any more. So this function here is going to be able to read in input from our user and place all of that in an array. So I need to actually use this. Um, first thing I'm going to do is create the array. I'm going to give it the same name here. It's going to be that big. And then I'm going to call the function read inputs. And I'm going to give that read inputs my array. So note that I'm giving it my array with no square brackets. I'm not trying to give it an element of the array. I'm not trying to give it part of the array. I'm trying to give it the whole array. So I'm giving it the address of the whole array. Well, it's not actually the address of the whole array. I'm giving it the whole array, which also happens to be the address of where the array starts. Um, read inputs also returns an integer, which is the number of inputs that are stored in the array. So I would like to store that somewhere. So in order to store that, I need to assign it to an integer variable. And I'm going to call that integer variable. Actually, I'm going to call it num inputs. So this thing now has read from my standard input a certain number of numbers, put them into this array that I've created, and I also now know exactly how many numbers went into that that I want to use. To test this, I wonder, oh yeah, I should actually do the print, the print numbers function as well. So I've got a void function here that just print nums, and it's also going to take that same array. So I'm going to call it the same thing. And this is another function that's going to say, okay, here is print nums. I should have just copied and pasted this, but anyway. So here is the function print nums, and this is actually going to be pretty basic. This is something that we've done before. It's going to loop through and just print out everything that's there. Print out all integers in the array. Oh, I did forget something. Up to the maximum number. So this is actually going to take in a number saying this is how many things we're using in the array. So we're not always going to be using all 100 spaces in this array. So for example, if I, when I read in, I typed in the number 10, then I would be only using the first 10 elements of the array. So I do actually want this print nums to know, um, I'm going to call it length, because it's the length of the, the amount of the array that we're using. Oops, that needs to be an integer. So that way when I call this, I can say we were using this much of the array, print out that much of it. In here, we're going to loop through and print everything out. So I'm going to do my standard thing, i is equal to 0, and I have a while loop. And this time, because I know exactly how many I'm going to have, while i is less than length, I'm going to print stuff out. So printf. Oops. And I'm going to be printing out integer values, and I'll put a space after them so they're all just spaced out. I'm going to just put them all on one line. <laughs> 
print out the integer values. And so those particular integer values are things I'm taking from my array, which is nums i. So this is just a pretty basic, oh, I forgot that one thing that I usually do is I usually set up the while loop before I actually write the code in it. So this while loop is going to go through the array up until the point I said it's going to stop. And then it's going to print out those numbers on a line. And at the end of the line, I will put an end line. An end line there. OK. So this is have printed out i numbers. So at each point in my loop, I know I've printed out that many numbers so far. So if i is equal to 0 at the start of my loop, I haven't printed out any numbers yet. OK. So after I've read the inputs in, I should be able to run print nums. And print nums was taking two things as input. First was the array itself, which is called nums. And the second thing was how far into that array we went, which was the num inputs. So now if I call these two functions, first function is going to read stuff in, second function is going to print stuff out. I've written a lot of code here without testing it, so I think that now's a good time to compile and test this and see how it goes. So, jumbler, output jumbler. Oh. <laughs> I usually don't like it if I've written that much code and it just compiles correctly straight afterwards because I just, I just sort of assume that I can't write that much code without making a mistake somewhere. So we'll just see what happens. Uh, it's just so much harder to find the mistake if your compiler didn't pick it up for you. So we're running the jumbler. How many inputs? Uh, we're going to keep this small for the moment. Let's have five inputs. And just to make it easy so we can understand what's happening, I'm gonna just going to do one, two, three, four, five. Two. Three, four, five, and hopefully this thing will stop here, stop reading inputs here and move on to the next thing. Ah, oh, there we go. It worked. So I typed in one, two, three, four, five. That one, two, three, four, five went into my array like that. And then I did print nums and it came out of the array there. So I'm not going to get time to finish this, but I do want to talk about something before I go further or wrap this up. Have a look at my main function here. So my main function here says create an array, then create an integer from the function read inputs, then run the function print nums. So I could nearly give this main function to someone who doesn't know anything about code, and they would have a reasonable idea about what's happening here they would be able to tell me, I mean, sure, the first line they probably don't know anything about. Um, but the second line, they will be able to tell me that somewhere in there there's reading inputs. And the third line, they'll be able to tell me somewhere along there there's printing numbers. So instead of having all of this stuff in there that people might not necessarily understand, someone can now read my main function who has very, very little idea about what's going on in C, and they can actually tell what's going on. So what I've done with my functions here is I've separated things based on their topic, in a sense. So one of them's reading stuff in, and the other's printing stuff out. And I've given them a nice English language name that we can read. So they don't even need to know that there's inputs and stuff going in here. They can just read the function names and go, this is exactly what this program does. Um, so this is something that functions really give us. They give us the ability to package complicated code, send it away somewhere else where people aren't going to read, and then they just read the nice things. And they go, oh, this is exactly how this thing works. So I'm going to continue this probably in the live stream on Friday, and we'll actually do the pointer stuff, because I didn't actually do any pointer code in this. But we'll do the pointer stuff and the jumbling and stuff like that and see how it goes. All right, see you all soon. <laughs>